I'm Karen Altfest. I'm executive vice president of Altfest Personal Wealth Management. I think I know almost everyone here, and if I haven't met you, please come and say hello. I'd really like to think that you've come here today for me. <laughs> or even I would accept Scandinavia House and me. <laughs> But if you're here principally to hear Jane Bryan Quinn, that's a great call on your part. About three quarters of the people here are currently clients of our firm. So a special shout out to all my friends who, who uh, I see often. Hello, everybody. And most everyone else is a friend or family member of, of one of our clients. And you're very welcome into the Altfest circle as well. So feel free to ask your personal questions because this presentation is going to give you a lot of food for thought about where you are and where you want to be. And if you don't want to wait till then, the, the people at your table can help uh, discuss some things with you. So come call us, come see us. Tell your table host or Melanie at the front desk where you signed in when it's convenient for you to come for your annual meeting, for a complimentary meeting if you're new to Altfest. And if you haven't yet been to our lovely space on Park Avenue and 57th Street to date, we're going to offer you a tour. And I can't make promises, but we just might welcome you into the inner sanctum, which is the parlor we have for women clients to um, be tech free for a while, no clocks, no phones. We do have lights, but, <laughs> but it's stress free and you could uh, talk freely in that room. And who knows, as I said, no promises, but we may serve you tea from our teapot with Queen Elizabeth on it. <laughs> and isn't she a role model? How old is your queen now, Reza? Uh, Dawn. And Don. 80. 89 in her family, that's a kid, right? So, <laughs> and, and if you ask me later, I might tell you of my favorite new shop in Brooklyn, which just happens to be a British shop of wonderful things owned by a woman with a British accent. I hope it's real. <laughs> Where I was this weekend with my new daughter-in-law. So it's uh, my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Jane Bryan Quinn. Jane's new book, which I said you'll all be getting, Making Your Money Last, a retirement book, was published in January of this year, so it's very new. Jane has a great knowledge of people and their financial questions. She has written a bi-weekly column on financial matters for Newsweek for 30 years and hosted a program, Take Charge, on PBS. She currently writes a column for AARP's magazine. Lou met Jane first, and I really hate telling you that, but <laughs> because she used to interview him for years for her Newsweek column. So, you know, I would know that Jane was on the phone and that Lou always enjoyed those conversations. But Jane and I did meet some years ago at a National Association for Personal Financial Advisors conference where she was one of the speakers. And uh, so we met some years back. Jane is respected both among the public and among professionals, and let me tell you that appealing to both groups is not easy. So I am delighted to have arranged for you to hear Jane today. Please welcome Jane Bryan Quinn. Well, thank you, Karen. I have certainly known the, I guess it was Lou I got to first, and then you, but I've known the Altfest firm for a, a long, long time, and I have great respect for it. So I'm very happy to be here and speaking to some of the clients. I am sure you are glad to know, by the way, that our subject is money instead of politics. <laughs> <laughs> you know why they call voting suffrage? It's because we have to suffer <laughs> through all these primaries. <laughs> I think Lily Tomlin got it right when she said, no matter how cynical you are, it's hard to keep up. <laughs> <laughs> but please, please don't let these political cage fights influence any of your financial decisions. We all know, if we didn't before, that many Americans have not kept up, and we are hearing from them this year, both from the left and from the right. They are a critical part of this political discussion. 
However, uh, just, just because this is going on doesn't mean bad things are going on in the economy as a whole. The recovery, is, the economy is doing fine, which is not what you will hear from many of the candidates who keep saying we're on the edge of catastrophe every time. The uh, consumers have been leading the economy up. The, uh, some of the pundits say, oh, no, we're going to have a recession, but I don't see that. Real disposable incomes are up. Price inflation is nowhere in sight. Household debt is down. Consumer sentiment is high. So the economy is actually not on the brink of catastrophe, so you've got to stop listening to these debates. Now, the stock market, I know, has alarmed some investors, probably some of you. My advice is to change the TV channel and watch something racy on cable. <laughs> Because worrying about a few weeks of up or down is an absolute waste of your worry bones. Worry about your kids or your grandchildren. There's probably somebody there you can worry about. <laughs> Don't worry about the stock prices. If something unexpectedly blows up, then I will await the judgment of the Senate Hindsight Committee. <laughs> Otherwise, I am forging ahead. I remain an optimist. Now, this is normal for me. I am not someone who smells flowers and looks around for a coffin. <laughs> As investors, we have been through many, many cycles like this, economic cycles, stock market cycles, and we have all survived. So for even in a testy election year, we will all survive. And now... Thank you very much. <laughs> and now, uh, so the basic principles still apply, no matter what is, what is going on around you. For your lives and mine, financially, save money, hold down debt, invest for the long term. All the rest is theater. Now, I started this book because I was thinking about the long term as being a retirement, retirement planning book, uh, specifically my own. Like uh, many of you, I suspect, in this room, I am thinking of cutting back my work hours. I'm at least thinking about it. My husband says I'll never make it, but I'm thinking about it. But my head began popping with questions about the life phase that we call retirement. After decades of working, we're finally free, but free to do what? A whole generation is now reinventing itself as it moves away from the world of earner and provider toward the new status of engaged, interested citizen retired. And not only are we trying to figure out what to do with ourselves in this new mode, or you will when you get there, we're trying to figure out how to pay for it. At retirement, None of us knows how many years we have ahead. You know, 20 years, 30 years, more. In April, my, mother, my family is going to celebrate my mother's 101st birthday. She is sharp and happy, and three years ago, she married a young man of 87. <laughs> So you never know. <laughs> now, centenarians like my mother are rare, but your lifetime might very well be much longer than you think. At 65, average life expectancy runs in the mid-80s, and average means half of you are going to be living longer than that. Also, those in the upper half of the income range in this country who have had good education, who have had health insurance all of their lives, they, on average, are living into their late 80s and up to 90, and I suspect that that's going to cover most of the people in this room. The 90-plus population has doubled over the past three decades, and in the next three, it is expected to triple. Now, when you are working and trying to save money, put money aside for the future, Usually all you think about having is more. Maybe you have a dollar target in mind, but maybe it's just more. I'm going to squeeze more out of my paycheck. I'm going to put more into my 401k. I I'm, I'm just have to build something. But then when 
you look at your money in a different way once you stop this accumulation period and you have a pot, that's your pot, more and more, then all of a sudden you look at this pot as an income stream. You stop looking at it as a pile of money. You say, how much is this money going to pay me for the rest of my life knowing that I don't know how long I am going to live? And that's a very different way, or how long my spouse is going to live for that matter, if there's two of you. So this is a very different way of looking at your money once you move out of the workforce, or you're still in the workforce, but you're doing planning for retirement or you have just entered retirement, it is very reasonable to worry that your money might not last as long as you do or at least fall short of supporting the style of life that you want. And, st and style of life means a lot, especially to those of us who have lived well. Our longevity means that we need to think very carefully about the kind of balance we have in our investments as we get older. Now the usual advice, along with what is generally our emotional inclination, is to reduce the amount we hold in equities and hold more in bonds and other fixed income investments as we get older. But you know, at 60 or 65, you have 25 or 30 years still to live. You are still a long-term investor, and you have to think about your money that way. A little disturbance in stocks, like the one we have had this first couple of months, shouldn't matter to you at all. You know, bonds and CDs and fixed income investments are fine for a horizon of five to seven years. Say you're retired and it helps you feel secure that you're going to pay the bills over the first uh, few years of your retirement, uh, no matter what happens to stocks, and that's very good. But what is going to fund the later years of your retirement? Over 10, 15, 20 years, the US economy is going to grow, the global economy is going to grow, profits are going to grow, stocks are going to grow, prices are going to grow. You need to be hitched to this growth to help maintain this, your style of life in your later years. So don't be afraid of moving up to the sort of edge of what you can take in stock market investments because you are a long-term investor and please keep that in mind just as you were a long-term investor when you were 40. Now for my book, I asked one of my investment sources to calculate how long it takes to get your money back after a stock market decline with dividends reinvested. So the stock market uh, starts here and then it goes down and then it comes back up and here's the point where you've made your money back and now you hope it's going to go higher. The average period for that is 29 months. Now, long-term investors can get through 29 months. That's nothing at all. All of a sudden, here we've had just two months, and everybody is saying, oh, dear, should I be in stocks? 29 months for including all of these uh, bull bear market cycles. Now, the, there, there's obviously a range here, and the longest cycle lasted a little over five years, which was 2000 to 2006, and that's, of course, most recently in our minds. So we basically think, oh, it's always going to be like that, but it's not. The shortest cycle was five months in 1998. So that's your window when, you know, five years to five months when, uh, during which time it, you, you have to wait to get your money back. But again, for long-term investors who also have investments in bonds and other income sources and who have cash, um, you shouldn't be worrying about that. But although the market always comes back, that is not necessarily true of individual stocks. Some stocks beat the market, some stocks lag, some stocks go to zero. They are not as sure a thing as investing in the market as a whole. So you can't count on that 29-month average also if you focus only on part of the market. Remember, that 29 months is for the whole market. If you are focusing on just part of the market, for example, you say, all I want is dividend stocks, which again is very common when you're thinking about income. Well, if that's what you focus on, you are not diversified anymore. Uh, 
the particular income stocks, uh, dividend stocks might do well, but you are skipping the growth stocks. So you might get less than the market as a whole. If you say, I'm only in the dividend stocks, I'm not in all of the market. Uh, a recent example of this would be the financials, the big banks. In uh, first part of 2003, 4, 5, 6, they were paying wonderful dividends. They were sort of your classic widow and orphan stocks. And then, of course, comes the collapse. Stock prices go down. Citibank hasn't recovered yet, among others I could mention. They cut their dividends. And this is what can happen when you focus on dividend stocks and you are not diversified over the entire market. Now, getting average market returns on your stocks might not matter to you, but you should at least be aware of it if you think you have to be a dividend investor. Also, again, be aware that dividends can be cut. Uh, they are not an automatic way of guaranteeing a specific income. It is a, con a conceptual mistake to define income as only interest and dividends when you're looking ahead to see how you're going to live. Long-term capital gains are income too. Dollars from any source are going to pay the bills. And what's more, looking for things called income investments sometimes leads people into really terrible choices. Uh, there are, are there unlisted real estate investment trusts. Uh, not listed on the stock market, they don't show their price, and these provide uh, promise high income, stable value, and they often deliver neither. But they're not in the stock market, you don't, don't know what the price is, you can't tell what's going on. It, you're getting a yield, a high yield, but that part of that high yield may be your own money back, and you don't even realize it. And, but you were led into this kind of thing Karen would never do this to you, but you're led into this kind of thing because you're looking for high income investments. And these are the things that are just killers these days when stocks are, when normal interest rates are so low. There are deferred variable annuities. They guarantee you a 5% return. You think, oh, great. But actually, you are not earning 5% on your investment. All you're getting, the, the insurance company is promising to give you your own money back in 5% increments over your life. People get into these things, and they pay 5 to 7% commissions. They pay 3.5% annual fees on these kinds of investments and they think they have a great retirement investment but all they are doing is helping uh, some salesmen's kids go to college not <laughs> your kids uh, do you know even and here's something interesting that uh, uh that i actually learned while i was doing this book um high yield bond mutual funds and they have a very interesting twist and i bought these mutual funds they are you buy them because, of course, government bond, if, if you want to be partly in bonds, government bond funds are paying virtually zilch. And so you say, well, a high yield bond fund, that's much better. And they are, uh, they are issued by low quality companies, and you know that, because that's why they pay such high interest rates. When things turn bad, what happens is, of course, some of the bonds default, some of them, they don't pay. Some of them have their quality cut, so they're worth much less. The Vanguard Mutual Fund Group did a fascinating study in 2012 of high-yield bond funds, and it showed that the money investors were losing from defaults and downgrades equaled or exceeded the extra interest that they were getting by being in the high-yield bond fund in the first place. So when it all washed out at the end, you might as well have been in treasuries all along. And treasury funds have the advantage of usually going up when stocks go down, which is very nice. It's a risk control. Now, whenever I make pronouncements about the market, I do keep in mind the ad that I saw in the Financial Times. It said, the Clairvoyant Society of Greater London will not meet next Tuesday because of unforeseen circumstances. <laughs> the future is unknowable, which is why we diversify. So let me tell you the story of the rich man on his deathbed, and he wants to take the money with him. 
So he emails God. He says, God, can I bring it with me? And God emails back, you can bring one carry-on. So <laughs> he looks over all of his wealth, his treasuries, his real estate, his stocks, his bonds, and he decides he's going to bring gold, packs up the gold, carries it up. St. Peter is at the gate. He says, what's that? He says, it's my, it's my wealth. God said I could bring it with me. St. Peter said, well, let me see it. And he opens up the carry-on and all these gold bars spill out. And St. Peter says, what? You've brought pavement? <laughs> <laughs> what you think is valuable now may not necessarily be valuable in the future. You can not predict. This is why simple things, diversification, good diversification, this is what will make a difference to your life, not trying to pick one particular thing that you think is going to save you. The income that you are looking for when you are planning your retirement and when you're in retirement should come from your investment's total return. The income, the dividends, the capital gains, all together, producing a total return that you're taking something out every month or every year without going on a specific hunt for income investments because they can lay you low. Now, personally, I don't buy individual stocks. I couldn't own enough of them to be truly diversified, and there is no way I know how to project a company's future earnings for five years out and know if it is selling at a reasonable price. So I'm a mutual fund investor myself, that's my style, uh, specifically index funds that follow the market as a whole. Uh, in fact, in his 2013 letter to shareholders, Warren Buffett wrote that in his will, he had told his advisor of his wife's trust to put 90% of the money into an index fund that followed Standard & Poor's 500 stock average and the remaining 10% in treasuries. And he wrote that he expected those two simple choices to get superior results. Now, I know that choosing index funds does not reflect the Altfest investment style. We all have different investment styles. But with their approach and with my approach in both cases, the point remains the same. A simple and well-diversified portfolio of investments prudently managed, leaving out the fancy stuff, focusing on the simple stuff. It will serve you better than all the fancy, high-cost investments that the mind of Wall Street, that the warped mind of Wall Street <laughs> can devise. Now, like you, I have an investment advisor. It goes without saying that it is, and by the way, he does it with mutual funds, so <laughs> it's my, my style. Right? It uh, goes without saying that it is a fee-only practice. I have always favored fee-only planners. In fact, that's how I met Lou in the first place, because they don't sell products on commission. Commissions bias an advisor's advice. That is what commissions are for. They're intended to do that. The farther away you can get from a firm that charges uh, commissions, the better off you are. Now often, and some of the, the big firms are here, the big investment banking firms and wealth advisory firms, they will manage your money for a flat percentage and you think, oh, well, this is just like a fee-only advisor. Well, believe you me, it is not. Because if they're in those firms, even though they are charging you just a flat fee for managing your money, you can be sure that the investments they are putting your money into are more expensive than you would get from a true, and have higher costs than you would get from a true fee-only firm. Higher costs always mean more for them and less for you. Now, I have many friends, as I'm sure you do, who choose advisors at big, famous investment banks because, let's face it, it is a status symbol. I am rich enough to en enter these hallowed halls somewhere downtown where there are really, really rich people sitting around with nice rugs and furniture. <laughs> Meanwhile, so there you are and you're feeling terrific because you're downtown and, and with, with these fancy people and the advisor, meanwhile, is going through your assets and murmuring, oh, fine, this looks good. There's enough here for both of us. <laughs> 
Now, some of these firms are operating divisions for women geared specifically to pair them with a female investment advisor. And they go on the theory that only another woman can comprehend our peculiar girly behavior <laughs> and mental states. Right? The throw pillows are probably pink. Now, this sort of sexist selection arises from studies that apparently show that women invest more timidly than men do, and they need a little more coaxing to assume investment risk. Many women assume that must be true, and this undermines their confidence in cases where it shouldn't. You know, a very high-level female, just a couple of weeks ago at lunch, informed me that she is sure that it's genetic, that the double X chromosome has something to do with taking our nerve away. She, of course, considered herself an outlier. She was talking about everybody else. These theories are baloney, if I can use an age-appropriate euphemism. Yes, these studies exist. They purport to show something about us. Maybe our lipstick makes us inherently risk averse. But, but, but. Often these studies are comparing all of the male and female investors at a large brokerage firm. But a lot of the women in these firms are Older investors, they're widows perhaps, they never had any experience handling money until their husbands died. When you take, so if you take that group out of the equation and you compare male investors with female investors who have had equal experience managing money, surprise, surprise, they make the same kinds of choices. Some of them good, some of them bad, but you cannot separate them out by gender. Uh, recently, an economist looked at 24 papers that studied gender and risk. Even unadjusted for experience, the differences between men and women were very small. On the, if you think of a bell curve of you know, how you invest or the amount of risk you take, uh, on the female side, there's a little margin of uh, more risk aversion. And on the male side, there's a little margin of extra risk readiness, but probably because they didn't have enough experience either, by the way. <laughs> the primary finding is that in most cases, male and female behaviors are alike linked to their experience, their education, their experience with managing money. Now, why isn't that the headline in these studies? Because it's boring. Doing Mars versus Venus is much more fun to report. And in any event, here's another thing I don't get. When they say, oh dear, women are risk averse, I don't quite get why over here in the margins, the super risk ready, why this should be what our target is. Why should, what, these guys are overdoing it and need to come back more than we are underdoing it and need to go up to them. Why is that a norm we should aspire to? I think they need to calm down. Now, nobody should be approached as a gendered investor with all of the baggage that entails. It is very pleasant for me and for you, I know, to be in a room of women with similar attitudes and some, it's nice, but the, the the presence, uh, the, the comfort of our company, I should say, is not the point of investment advisory systems. There, some of us are risk averse. Some of us are risk ready. Some of us are well informed. Some of us are not. We are all individuals. There is no such thing as a female investment approach. What matters in any advisory relationship for men as well as for women is the respect you get, the accuracy and fullness of the information you receive, and the quality of the advice. And if it's a woman advisor, fine, and if it's a male advisor, fine. The question is, how are you doing with the advice? And by the way, you don't have to be good at math to be a good investor. I run into that a lot of times. Uh, I personally am terrible at math. 
I always was. I don't trust any calculation I make until it's checked. I ha used to have three or four people, anything that was going in my Newsweek column that we had to add or subtract or worse, always checked before I put it in and I learned that the hard way. Good investment, good investment sense, good financial planning has nothing to do with math. It is purely common sense. Now, one piece of advice that I'm sure you are getting from the Altfest firm is what I call right-sizing your life. Will you be able to afford your standard of living when your paycheck stops or if you're married when your husband's paycheck stops? When doing retirement planning, people tend to ask, how much money am I going to need? You add up your expenses, you say, that's what I'm going to need, and you tell your financial advisor, please, will you produce that? Thank you very much. That is exactly backward. The question to ask is, how much income am I going to have from Social Security, maybe a pension, plus prudent, regular withdrawals from the savings and investments that you have? How much income am I going to have? And once you've computed that amount, you adjust your spending to fit. If you have plenty of money to carry you for 30 years or more, you can relax and get on with your life. If the numbers, however, show that you might come up short, well, you can work longer, you can save more, you can spend less. You know, there are three simple choices there and not much more. No financial plan will work if you are burning through money too fast. You will not be saved by finding a higher interest rate or a better stock. You should right size your life so you know that the money won't run out. Now some of you are on top of all your investment decisions and you already know how likely it is that your money will last and if it won't, what you have to do about it. Others let Karen worry about it, <laughs> don't think themselves. If you are in the second group, I urge you please to sit down for a tutorial. Because when you don't, haven't actually looked at the numbers and you don't know where the money will come from, someone can say, oh, don't worry, you're fine, you're fine, but you will always worry a little bit. If you're spending too much, the sooner you learn about this, the better. You should sit down and look and say, okay, you say I'm fine. Where is the money? How are you going to pay me? Where do I get it for the rest of your, uh, my life? And if you're married, by the way, it is not okay to let your husband do it. And it's also not okay to have a plan only for your lifetime as a couple. I see this happening, in fact, a lot. People retire and they say, okay, they sit down, they look at their budget, they work it all out, but then what if, what if the husband, say, dies tomorrow? Suddenly, they hadn't planned for that. You need to know how you are going to live. First, you need to know what your life as a couple is likely to be, will your money last? But also, what happens if you retire and the next day uh, your husband slips on a curb and breaks his neck and there you are by your own? Have you done that planning? How will you last alone? And likewise, if you break your neck on the curb, how will your husband do? Is he dependent? If you're the breadwinner, is he dependent on the income and have you considered that? It, it is actually more important to know how you will survive, or your husband, if you die, how he will survive as a single than it is even to know what you're going to be doing as a couple because you could live a whole lot longer than your spouse. One final word thinking about retirement is that you need an emotional plan as well as a financial plan. It is very tricky to move from the status of active, admired professional to the status of engaged citizen retired. You should not underestimate the difficulty of that. You need to plan for that as well as you plan for your financial transition. You'll have 20 or 30 years ahead of you. That's how it works. The young people are coming up. We're going out. That's the way the world works. But you've got 20 or 30 years. You have to find something fulfilling to do. I have a friend who is now dead who had a very prominent position in the magazine world. And 
he, when he retired, he stayed in New York for a couple of years, and then he moved to San Francisco. He said that New York was for players, and he couldn't stand not being a player, so he got out of town. Now, in my opinion, he succeeded professionally, but he failed at retirement. And I don't want to move to San Francisco, so I'm going to have to figure that out. And I thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. And now I will look forward to questions, objections, and complaints. <laughs> thank you very much. That was very inspiring. And if it's OK, while we're gathering everybody's questions, I'll lead off with a few. OK. So do you prefer to stay there? Or? Yeah? No, I'll okay. stay here. So um, some months ago, on uh, the request of, of a lot of our women clients, we offered Financial Planning 101 to clients. They asked for it, and we gave it to them. And it included setting goals, different areas of financial planning, diversification and in investing, some of the things you've talked about. But from your experience in meeting all these different groups, they've been asking for Financial Planning 201. How would you see that? What, what should we put in that course? Uh, fin financial Planning 201. 20, they've well, asked for that next. We're, we're, well, he, now here's a very interesting question, in fact, because <laughs> how complicated do you actually want it to be? I am a great believer in the idea that the most sophisticated plan is actually the simplest one, not the most complicated one. So yes, you can, I mean, obviously you can start asset allocation and do the kinds of things we're talking about long-term in stocks, right-sizing your life, which is critical, understanding how the market works so that you don't go into a freak out after two months of a minor uh, market decline as we have had now. Um, how much further you want to go is interesting. I don't know whether you need to, do you really think you need to go that much further? I mean, you're not going to analyze stocks. You're not going to, uh, I, I don't know what your plans would be other than 101. I'm, I'm a little mystified. Right. So I'm not sure either. And I'm going to reach out to some people to tell me what they would like to know more about when the time comes. <laughs> no. And um, I liked your concept of power saving in the book. Mm -hmm. Can you explain a little about that? Oh, well, this is, uh, and this is very closely attached to the idea of once, once you really start getting serious about planning for retirement, and that is that you simply have to save more money. And if, or first, you have to look at what you've got to see how you are going to live. If you, uh, if you lost your job tomorrow, or if you had to retire early, or your, your husband was ill and you felt you had to leave work to take care of it. All these kinds of things can happen. And so while you have a paycheck, it is really important to save as much as you possibly can. And to max out on a 401k or a 403b to save even more than that, if that is possible. And I have especially younger people tell me that they're living paycheck to paycheck. They can't possibly save any more money. I get that. Uh, when I was in my early 20s, uh, at a time, I might add, when they were not paying women what they were paying men, even close, and it was legal <laughs> not to. And I had, I was single at that point, and I had a baby, a child, and uh, I was living paycheck to paycheck, and I did not join the company retirement plan. And the person in the office next to me said, Jane, you're signing. This was, this was before, I, I was very early in my learning about money back then too, because I wasn't born with it. We all learn it. Um, I, he said, sign up. And I said, I can't possibly do it. I'm living paycheck to paycheck. And, and worse, I can't pay the dentist. And he said, sign up. And I did for 5% of my meager salary. And you know what happened? Nothing happened. I didn't notice it. I was still living paycheck to paycheck. I still wasn't paying the dentist. But somehow it picked up some little bit of money that I didn't know was slipping through my fingers. And it was now going into this retirement account. And so 
I went to 7%, I went to 10%. At 10%, I noticed and I stopped. <laughs> but but I'm, so I, I'm very sympathetic with the idea that you're living paycheck to paycheck. You've got student loans, you've got this, you've got that, you can't do it. But if you start small and build, you can do it. And in, when you're working in your, you know, by the time you're late 40s, your 50s, I know your kids are in college, there are all these things going on, but you've got to squeeze your paycheck like a sponge because these are the years you have to make money. And when your paycheck stops, what you've got is what you've got. There's no extra shower of money coming down on you from some mysterious source. And even if you think you're going to inherit, uh, your mother may marry a young man of 87. <laughs> and leave it all in him, right? <laughs> so so you, the inheritance, you know, don't count on that. You have to build your life on the assumption, uh, I mean, some of you, I suppose, I can't have one large enough that you can count on, but you should really build your life on the assumption you can't. And that simply means paying attention to saving the money because that is what is uh, going to be a huge part of your lifestyle for 25 to 30 plus years. Uh, there are a lot of questions here, yep. so uh, let me get started. What do you think of long-term care insurance? Uh, long-term care insurance, well, uh, one thing to tell you what I think about it is that I have it. Uh, the, it is expensive, as you know, uh, but there are ways of reducing the cost of long-term care insurance because uh, you can, instead of having it for life, you can have it for just two or three years, or maybe if you're older, you say, I'm not going to take the inflation adjustment, and there are other ways that you can squeeze down the cost of the premium. One of the problems, as you know, those of you who have had it or read about it, is that um, uh, some of them have been raising the premiums sharply. You thought they were going to be level. They're going up 35, 40 percent in price. Uh, John Hancock is a good one that's doing that. Genworth is doing that. Uh, so if you're buying long-term care insurance, you should ask how they have treated their previous policyholders. And it, I know of only three, there's probably more uh, companies that have never raised premiums on existing policyholders, and it's Mass Mutual, New York Life, and uh, Northwestern Life. This is not a prediction. I don't know. They might raise it in the future, but it's one of the things that you can look at. If you're single, I'm not sure that this should be at the top of your list, because if you are ill and need uh, care, and need long-term care, whatever, you, you know, you've got a house, you've got an apartment, you know, you've got some savings, that's going to help pay for you. The issue is when you're married and one of you needs long-term care and the other one is a spouse at home, that is the situation where long-term care insurance becomes very valuable. Uh, I will tell you a personal story about this, actually. I was uh, uh, widowed about 10 years ago. My husband was much older than I was, and when it, when these policies first started coming out, they really were terrible policy. You couldn't count on what they'd pay for. They were just, you know, I didn't buy them because they, they at that point, weren't worth it. And so then they started getting good policies. And so, uh, but then he couldn't pass the health exam anymore. So he had no uh, long-term care insurance. And then he had a very, very difficult last couple of years. And I will tell you, because if you're married and you're thinking about what costs might be, it cost $100,000 a year to take care of him at home with uh, you know, round-the-clock care. And uh, so that's what you're looking at. So then I'm a widow, and I start dating this nice man. And he thinks we should get married. And I said, do you have long-term care insurance? <laughs> You know, been there, done that, you know, one, one per customer. <laughs> and he didn't, but he got it, and we got married. <laughs> so, so. Uh, we have a question about whether somebody should be 
globally diversified and not invest in domestic stocks and companies only? Um, globally, this again, these are all such interesting questions. In the uh, in the S and P, I think about half of the you would know this, Karen. About half of the S and P earnings, I think, are now from international corporations. So if you were in, you know, in, in my case, since I'm an index fund investor, if I'm in a total market U.S. fund and it's got large stocks and small stocks, I actually am getting a lot of earnings in from uh, the international companies that are in the S&P. Uh, but I think there's a case for um, for, and I would take again probably a mutual fund here rather than trying to buy individual stocks abroad, uh, there is a case for being diversified um, with an international index fund, say. There, uh, it's a currency diversification. Uh, it is uh, sometimes our market goes down when their market goes up, so it can be a certain form of risk control, although for a long time they all went up and down together. I'm, I don't think it's necessarily as critical as we thought it was once upon a time, but I think in general terms of trying to diversify, I would, I would say, yes, I would look at an inner, but I would look at it in terms of, um, of a mutual fund rather than trying to buy anything individually in stocks. The, the, of the two big index funds, um, Vanguard uh, internationally has large and small companies, and Fidelity has only large companies. So again, you look at what type of fund it is, but uh, Karen is looking at that for you, I guess. Yes, somebody asked what actually is a mutual fund. A mutual fund. Um, a mutual fund is a, like a pot of money, and everybody, uh, Everybody in this room say, says, puts up $100 and we've got now a pot of money and we have a manager and a manager goes and invests in different companies at, for us and each of us owns a piece of that pot and any dividends or capital gains or whatnot come out to us collectively. And it is a basic way of, and simple way of investing your money because there's a large, a large number of people are all invested together and the manager is running the money or in case of an index fund, basically a computer is running the money and, and you own a little piece of it. So you don't own individual stocks Again, you own a, a large share in this mutual fund that we are all invested in and, and that it has a huge number of stocks, so you're well diversified and you get, you get a piece of that pie. Have I? A few people have asked about whether you uh, uh, think it's a good idea to have reverse mortgages. Reverse mortgages. Um, the, I, I used to say no because there were problems with the product, especially um, people would get them when they, uh, w when you're running, you, a reverse mortgage is when you want to stay in your home and you take a loan against the equity in your home or your apartment if the co-op lets you do it and the, uh, and this loan you don't have to repay currently. The loan plus the interest rate kind of builds up. You don't, you, you don't pay anything currently. Only when you leave the house, if you die or you go in a nursing home or you sell the house for some other reason, at that point all of this loan money that's building up plus interest is repaid out of the proceeds of the house. And if uh, the loan is, turns out to be larger than what the house is worth, then the bank swallows that, or rather the taxpayer swallows that, since it's insured by Fannie Mae, uh, well, FHA. Or if there's anything left over, if your loan is small and the house is worth much more than that, then you or your heirs get the difference in equity. Uh, if it was always sold as if you are in your later age, and you are running out of money, but you still want to stay in your house, you could take this reverse mortgage against your house, and then you would have more income. Uh, and one of the problems was that, that you took it as a lump sum, and then by paying taxes, insurance, then you ran out of money again. And if you couldn't pay the taxes and insurance, you could be evicted and closed out. Not That didn't happen much 
because it was very bad publicity for a bank to throw an old lady out of a house. So, but, but there were many people who were at risk of this. They now have a new, about a year and a half ago, Congress passed rules, so that basically can't happen anymore. Uh, because if you are at that kind of risk, they create a pot for you to make sure that insurance and taxes are paid. So the way to use a reverse mortgage, uh, if, if, you're, if you're really at that point where you need the money in order to stay in your house, I would first ask the question, should I just sell the place and take the money and move somewhere cheaper and give this whole thing up? So I, that would be my opinion if you're at that point. There's an, another interesting use of a reverse mortgage, though, that has come into vogue with some financial planners. And the earliest you can get it is age 62. So if you took a reverse mortgage at 62, you don't take the money out. You take it uh, right away. You, you take it in the form of a credit line. And this is sort of a magic credit line because it grows every year by the same amount, by the same rate you are paying on the loan that's building up on your mortgage inside your the reverse mortgage inside your house. So if you don't borrow for 10 years or 12 years, and then your other sources of money while you are in retirement seem to be running a little low, uh, you can all of a sudden, over here is this credit line that has now been growing for 10 plus years. It's much larger than it was when you started. So you have this, this big credit pot that you can start drawing money out of. And some people are using it saying, well, I have some stocks and I have some bonds and I have some, I've got this credit line. So if stocks are going down, maybe in order to pay my bills, I'll take it out of the credit line this year instead of selling anything at a loss. And, and so you can, there's a, it gives you a third pot of money, if you will, or if you have cash, bonds, stocks, it's the fourth pot of money that, that potentially gives you some uh, withdrawal power where you can have some more cash coming in. I would not, the upfront costs of these mortgages are high and often they are put on the credit line so you do start with a loan but you don't take any other money out. I would not take it unless you really, really knew you wanted to live in your house for 15 or 20 years because it takes a long time to amortize that upfront cost. But that is a way that some financial planners are using reverse mortgages these days. Okay, how important do you think growth in China is to the financial wellness of the rest of the world? Um, I think that China is extremely important, but I don't think it's going to bring the world down. <laughs> yeah. it, uh, you never know, of course, when you make these kinds of pronouncements. Remember the clairvoyant society, right? <laughs> but it is very clearly China is very important to, to the global economy and it's slowing down, it affects Southeast Asia, but just as important is Europe. I mean, when you look at what the U.S. has done to climb out of the financial collapse in terms of cleaning up its banks, putting in regulation, uh, requiring you know, minimum reserves, I mean, a lot of things are going on in this country. We've cleaned up a lot of stuff. Europe has not. And so, I would say one would be just as concerned about the fact that Europe, I mean, include, of course, there's the refugee problem, which is enormous, and then you haven't solved Greece, and you haven't solved the Italian banks, and I mean, they've got a lot of problems in Europe. So we have two areas where growth could be slower, but U.S. growth has been, has been very good, and I don't see any reason for it to stop. Mm. Great. But I wouldn't invest in Chinese real estate <laughs> <laughs> on the side, just in case you were thinking. <laughs> uh, a few people have asked about annuities. So are there some annuities you prefer, and how do they match up versus other types of investments? Okay. Uh, I mentioned briefly the uh, deferred variable annuity with living benefits and blah, blah, blah. It has a few other names on the end of it. I call that one of the black hat annuities because they cost you so much and you are 
P people buy these things because they think it, you, it will, they will have a higher income in the future than the guarantee. They don't understand that the guarantee is mostly their own money back. And they don't understand that the fees are so high, you will probably not get the higher amount that you are paying for. So I, I just, I don't like any of these. And if you are in them, by the way, and somebody's, my dear, my dear second husband now, actually he, when he sold his business, a very fancy downtown investment advisor put a lot of his money into one of these annuities. I was very annoyed, <laughs> but it was before me. And um, there is a way of, if you're in one of these, there is a way of slowly extracting your own money so that when the time comes and you want to say, pay me a, 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 the percentage you promised for the rest of my life, uh, you start using the insurance company's money instead of yours. It, you have, it's in the book on page 145, <laughs> I happen to know. <laughs> Uh, there's another type of annuity that I call a white hat annuity, and this is a very simple, simple product. It's an immediate pay annuity, and you put up some money, and you, um, the insurance company says, thank you very much, I will pay you X dollars a year for life, or you and a beneficiary for life if, if uh, you're covering somebody else. And, and it's a guaranteed income that I just think is a, has a very useful place in financial planning in certain circumstances. Uh, for example, uh, you retire and you've done your income projections and you think you're fine or you think you might be fine and then you're in it for a few years and you start saying, you know, I'm afraid my money might run short. And then Probably you have in your in investment, you probably have some bond mutual funds, say. You could take part of the money out of your bond mutual fund and put it into an immediate pay annuity that would instantly increase your income because the annuity is going to pay you more per month than you could prudently withdraw out of the bond fund that you had. So this, is a, this would be a circumstance of a good use of an immediate pay annuity. There's also, like the immediate pay, there's a deferred annuity, very simple product, where you say, I'm gonna buy it now, and I want the income to start 10 years from now. That would be another useful way of saying, I wanna guarantee my income from some point in the future. So those types of annuities, I think, are good. But any of these variable annuities where you have investment guesses and whatnot and all these high fees. I just, I beg you, no, no, no. <laughs> okay. Is there any chance of Medicare sometime soon covering uh, Americans who live abroad? Uh, Medicare, Americans, do you know they don't do that? It doesn't cover live abroad, no. No, you can get Social Security abroad, but you can't give Medicare abroad, and I would say no, not a chance. Uh, if you want to uh, move abroad, as many people do, you need to move to a place that has good health care, and there are a lot of those places. I mean, there is a lot of medical tourism, in fact. Uh, just if you ha don't have good, good enough insurance, you can go and get something cheaper. You, you, know, you go to, th to uh, Thailand, places like that. A lot of people are actually doing that, but if you want to move abroad, you have to look at what that health system will pay you. Uh, the next question is, hmm. is the election going to uh, affect the economy? As a friend of mine, you say, let me say this about that. Um, the in most cases, the, the economic cycle moves as it moves, regardless of which party is in power. Presidents don't make all that much of a difference to the economic cycle in most cases. Where they make more of a difference is in things like the sort of the thing we're discussing now in politics, in social programs, in the wealth gap, in issues like that. There, a particular party can make a difference. But 
when you are looking at the, uh, when you kind of go back and say, who is in power at different times. You can link a little something to a presidential policy, but basically uh, business is gonna come and go according to other rules and consumer rules and how we're spending and what's happening in Europe or not happening in Europe or whether Wall Street has some other stupid investment that blows up, having nothing to do with the president, so. For, for a person who is 70 years old now, is 65% of the investments in stocks reasonable? Um, I would say that that is the outer edge of reasonable. Um, so I would not worry about it. I assume that you have on the side, you know, the, the, there's this business like bucket investing, which is you have, you have three buckets, your stock bucket, your bond bucket, and your, your cash bucket. If there's enough in your cash bucket or your short-term bond bucket so that you know you can pay all your bills for the next two or three years, and then you've got some short-term bonds that you know you could pay them for another two or three years, you know, you could be quite reasonably invested in stocks because you have made yourself safe for, say, five years through your cash bucket, through your short-term bonds, and then you could be quite flexible with what you are doing with stocks. And it also matters is, do you need the money? Many people are managing money for the next generation in which case you would be quite right to have a higher percentage in stocks. Why isn't it better to in invest in individual stocks rather than through mutual funds or ETFs? I, I see. For me, it's a reverse. I would not buy individual stocks. <laughs> um, because I personally, I, I cannot guess, and a lot of it is a guess, I know there's a lot of analysis done, but which stock is going to be better? Very hard to know, because if you think about the stocks you own, I don't know how much you know about the company, its management, what its products are, what, it, what is the margins of its various lines of business, where it stands in the global economy. I mean, there are a lot, and lots of, uh, is there too much debt? Uh, lots of questions like that, and if you can't answer those questions, then you have no basis for buying, selling, or holding, except to say, well, I think the price will go up. Well, why do you think the price will go up? You know, you don't know. The price might go down. So I think it's very hard to pick individual stocks. I think that, I, I mean, I've done it you, early on. You start out, you do that. That's what you're supposed to do, right? And then you find out there are better ways of doing it. But the um, other issue is diversification. Uh, if you own, let's say you own 25 stocks, you aren't anywhere close to diversification. You need lots of industries. You need big companies. You need small companies. You need companies that are more international. You need companies that are more service. You, you cannot do that. I, I mean, there are, you need several hundred stocks actually to have a well-diversified portfolio. Otherwise, you are sort of guessing. You're saying, well, I think that uh, the energy business is going to do better now, so I'm going to put money in the energy business. Well, you might be right, you might be wrong, but you do not have, it, it's not, for me, this is not a long-term plan, and this is why I don't buy individual stocks, because I don't think I am smart enough to figure out which is going to be the best stock and which, which is going to do well, I, and I think it's very hard to beat the market as a whole with individual stocks, so that's why I don't buy them. So. Uh, uh, somebody asked whether women have different decisions and concerns, and I assume it means than men do. <laughs> do women, well, uh, we do have concerns in that we live longer. Obviously, that is something that affects women. Um, what's interesting about that, by the way, is that um, in, in the workplace, Many of us are paid less, many of us are paid the same, I'm happy to say. That's what we marched for in the old days. I'm very happy to see that happening. The, um, on average, you see the pay gap, women are paid a little less, but what happens when they study these um, retirement programs is that women are, in this average again, uh, are putting more money into the savings accounts but it's a lesser dollar, um, um, 
in terms of percentage, a higher percentage in the savings, it's a lesser dollar amount because they're being paid less. But we are certainly well aware of our longevity. And I would say that that is the principal concern for a female investor as opposed to a male investor, just in terms of your, your life and your lifestyle. Okay. Um, there, I want you to save some strength for signing books, but maybe we could do one or two more. So uh, what is your opinion, this has come up a few times, of Warren Buffett's plan for his wife when she when he's no longer here. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so that the, the trust being 90% in uh, the index fund following Standard & Poor's 500 and 10% in treasuries. Uh, I would update the S&P to say you should buy a total market fund because the S&P is only large stocks and the total market is large and small stocks, which I think is a better diversification. So I think that is how I would update that. I have other, and remember, uh, Mrs. Buffett is managing for the next generation. <laughs> this is not money that she needs currently in order to live. So, so that's, Excellent that's point. why she's 90% um, in, in stocks. And one, one more. Do you think a 529 plan is a good idea for grandchildren? A 529 plan for grandchildren. These are the plans. They're uh, run by the states in New York State, and Connecticut, New Jersey. They all have a 529 plan. And you uh, put money in, and I don't, they're, there's a tax break, and I don't know how different it is among the three states. I think some of you are from probably from Connecticut or New Jersey, I don't know, as well as New York. But there's a tax break, a deduction, and the money grows tax deferred, and then uh, when it's taken out for education purposes, uh, there's no tax on it at all. So this is an advantageous program. I want to give you an alternative possibility if you are working and have a paycheck. Uh, you could start a Roth IRA for your grandchild. Uh, intending it to be used as a uh, as a college planning, and these are very flexible instruments. If you ever needed the money out, you can take take out your own contribution at any time with no penalty. So you could get it back if you if you had to. And if the money is not used for college, it just continues to grow, and it, it would come out tax-free whenever it comes out. So you, you, and you can take money, you, since you can take your own contribution out, this is something you would take out to help with the college expenses. I just, it sort of depends on your circumstances, but yes, the 529 is good. The paperwork is a pain in the neck because I've used them. But um, a Roth IRA is something else that you should look at. And also, if, if the parents are saving for college, it's something that the parents could look at. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you.